<laughs> Good evening, Gabriel John Calvert. Terima kasih. Okay, can we start our uh, activity today? Please. Okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone, and good evening, Dr. Kubert. Uh, let me uh, start our activity today. The Honorable Head of Nursing Department, Dr. Untung Sujianto, SKPMKES. The Honorable Head of Nursing Study Program, Bapak Agus Santoso, SKPMKES. The Honorable Head of Nurse Profession Program, Ibu Nurse Artika Nurahima, Escot MK, and our respected guest lecturer today, Dr. Gabriel John Colbert. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mega, and I will be the moderator for our guest lecture today. Uh, for your information, today is the 22nd anniversary of our nursing program. And this special day, we are so grateful to have Dr. Colbert from the University of Illinois at uh, to share his expertise in HIV and addiction, particularly among prisoners. Before we start our lecture, I invite Dr. Untung Sujianto to provide uh, to open this uh, lecture. Dr. Untung, uh, time is yours. Terima kasih, Bu Megah, atas waktunya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, uh, Dr. Kalbert uh, John. Uh, Dr. Gabriel John Calvert. First of all, let us thank God for giving us the opportunity to attend the general lecture for post for student in nursing department of the medical faculty, Universitas Diponegoro, Semarang, Indonesia. I, as the head of the nursing department, would like to welcome Gabriel John Calvert, PSDRN, from University of Illinois Chicago. Welcome to Undip Semarang, a beautiful, warm, and enchanting city with rice, Japanese history and tradition. But hopefully, someday you can really visit Semarang in the near future after the pandemic COVID-19. The general lecture today has one topic, the yeah, holistic intervention for its IV and addiction with people in prison. I think Gabriel John Calvert, PSDRN, I hope that this activity will increase our sight into spiritual and holistic science in advanced nursing practice and become the foundation of nursing development in the future. Without waiting any longer, I officially open the general lecture and I hope that will benefit the student and lecture. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Unun, for the opening. And then uh, I would like to greet Dr. Gilbert. How are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. And now we start our session. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to introduce our participant today. Uh, we have students for the undergraduate and postgraduate level. And we have uh, alumni and some uh, guests uh, from uh, correctional uh, from Lapas, Ambarawa. We, are, we also invite nurses uh, in this moment so they can get uh, maybe knowledge more, can be implemented uh, implement to uh, their institutions. Okay, uh, everyone, uh, before we can, uh, beginning our session, let me read uh, Dr. Colbert. Dr. Gabriel John Colbert RN is an associate professor 
at Department of Population, Health, Nursing, Science, University of Illinois at Chicago College of Nursing. He has so many research grants and awards related to HIV and addictions in criminal justice settings and receiving, I think, hopefully millions of US dollars and published in a lot of uh, international conferences and journal publications. He also a peer reviewer in several journals and speakers in many events, I think. Okay, without our do, I invite Dr. Robert to deliver, to deliver his speech. Okay, Dr. Robert, time is yours. All right, I'm going to share my screen. And... Can you all see my slides? Yes. Great, great. So we're on, we're literally on the same page. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today to nurses. And uh, this is something that I'm very passionate about. And um, I love speaking about my work in Indonesia. So thank you very much for the honor and the invitation to present uh, on the work that I'm doing with my colleagues at Universitas Indonesia in, uh, in Jakarta. So today I'm going to talk about a global health problem, which is the challenge of HIV and substance use uh, for people in prison. And this is a global health problem because we see these issues in many countries, including the United States and including Indonesia. So I'm going to talk about the, some of the similarities and some of the differences and how I ended up in Indonesia working uh, on issues related to HIV and addiction, including with some of you in the audience today uh, with whom I've had the pleasure of working. So, so. so I assume that there are students in the audience today. So I wanted to just briefly talk about my, my pathway in nursing um, and, and maybe, uh, share what that journey looks like for me. And I think it looks different depending on what your, your goals are. But I started out as a clinical nurse uh, more than 10 years ago. And it was during that time that I had the opportunity to travel to Indonesia with a nursing program. And that's when I met Dr. Waluyo and uh, Dean uh, Eli Narakma at Universitas Indonesia. So that was was when I was introduced both to the, the, the country and also to my, my current collaborators. Then I completed a PhD at the University of Illinois and then a postdoc for two years where I went back to Indonesia and did research with uh, the director general uh, Pamasya Rakatan in Jakarta and also spent a year in Malaysia working uh, at the University of Malaya uh, in a prison in Kuala Lumpur. And now I do research at the University of Illinois and I'm going to talk about two projects that we have done in Jakarta. So Indonesia has a large HIV epidemic because of its size, like, like India and China. So we have this phenomena where we have a relatively low prevalence in the general population, but because of the size of key populations in Indonesia and because of the size of Indonesia's overall population, that turns out to be a lot of people. Now estimates vary and, and I think these are old estimates, and I, I mean 2019, um, and they're, they're UNAIDS estimates. So I understand that uh, official figures from Kementerian uh, Kesehatan may be a little bit different, may be updated. Uh, but this just gives a general picture 
of the Indonesia HIV epidemic compared to some of the other countries in the region. And one of the, one of the unique characteristics about the HIV epidemic in Indonesia for the last 10 years has been that the number of new cases was not coming down uh, or was not coming down as quickly as, as, as we would expect based on some of the interventions that were being delivered at the national level. And so the question was, what's happening now with the epidemic? Uh, where, where is the epidemic going next? And so with, the, you know, with HIV, and I think also we're learning with COVID, um, it's, it's a challenge for epidemiologists to anticipate where the epidemic will be tomorrow. Um, even knowing where it is at present is difficult. So predicting where it will be in the future is, is, is a very challenging sort of thing to do, but that's, that's what our job is. So one of the things that attracted me to this work was an article in the United States many years ago that showed that in the United States, one out of every five persons with HIV would pass through a jail or prison each year. So if you're a public health uh, policy person or a clinician or a researcher, you immediately start to think, well, I have interventions for people with HIV. I have interventions for people with substance use. How do I go about finding people who need these interventions? And the, one of the answers is, is jails and prisons because risk factors for incarceration in many countries, including the US, including Indonesia, are the same as the risk factors or similar to risk factors for HIV acquisition or substance use. So the same article that I talked about said that a third of people with tuberculosis in the United States go to jail or prison every year. So you can think of jails and prisons as, as key sites within the national healthcare system just like you think of Puskesmas or hospital as being the central locations where we, where we deliver services to people. Prisons and jails are similar to the hospitals and clinics, except I would say, I would argue that the acuity is higher in the prison compared to the Puskesmas. But I would, I would be interested to hear feedback from some of the nurses uh, who work in, in the La Paz um, about the patient acuity, because I think that's, that's a, a main issue. And in the United States, what they found is that the burden of mental and physical health problems uh, among people in prison is much higher compared to the community. Uh, Ibu Mega, should I take questions when they come up or should I take questions at the end? I Maybe think... uh, at the end, you can. Okay, uh, I think Chut Sri has a, has a question. Okay. But I'll, maybe we'll save questions till the end. So this, uh, so this slide is, is showing that, that when you go into prisons, you find rates of HIV that are much higher compared to the community. And my point here is that these are excellent places to begin a process of care for people that continues after they leave prison and reenter society. So I know that's old news for some of you who already work in these settings. You could teach us a lot about what's happening. So why, where do we focus globally when we think about uh, addressing issues of substance use. We're sort of turn, we, we looked at HIV, now we're looking at substance use. And I highlighted some of the countries like China and India and Indonesia and the United States just to make the point that although the prevalence of substance use disorders is higher in some of these high income countries like the United States, and I I mean, United, you look at where United States is. United States is up there with former Soviet Union countries, including Russia. So 
really, really, it's in a group of countries that that is experiencing now an epidemic of of substance use, right? This slide is showing the proportion of females in the society who have an alcohol or drug use disorder. And so my point is the prevalence is higher in former Soviet Union in the United States. It's lower in Indonesia, much Indonesia has very low prevalence, but because Indonesia is such a large country, it has a lot, it has almost the same number of people of women with drug or alcohol use disorders as the United States. So this, this is just showing you the prevalence is, is an important indicator of, of how serious a public health problem it is, but we also have to look at the absolute numbers. We have lots of people with substance use disorders in living in Asia. I think almost a third or of people with substance use disorders globally live in Asia. So in the United States, as some of you have no doubt read, we are in the middle of a large opioid crisis, which has many causes, including uh, doctors who prescribed many, many pain pills during the last decade to people. And then those people went on to become addicted to heroin and fentanyl and other drugs. So life expectancy in the United States actually went down for the first time in like almost a hundred years because of these diseases of despair, some people call them. Um, so these are some of the statistics. 1.6 million Americans had an opioid use disorder in the last year. All, three, three quarters of a million people used heroin in the last year. This is just in the United States. And 70,000 people died from preventable drug overdose, totally preventable. And other factors include uh, the global drug supply. You know, we talk about global health and how politics and economics affects human health. Well, uh, there have been global political and economic events that have changed where drugs are produced, that have changed how drugs are sold, that have changed the types of drugs that are entering the illegal markets. And so all of those political and social changes affect what's happening at the community level in terms of drug use and drug overdose. So there's a huge effort among researchers and clinicians in the United States with millions of dollars being spent to try to control the, the, the harmful consequences of opioid use in the United States. So this is a very large and serious national effort that has the support of multiple presidential administrations. Would you let me know if I'm not doing okay for time, if I'm, if, if I'm going too slowly or if I'm running out of time? So, but it's, you know, we often think about HIV or we think about drug dependence or we think about tuberculosis, right? As these kind of like discrete problems. But as you nurses know, these are overlapping problems. And if you work in the La Paz if, or if you work in the, the, the Rutan, you know that we see people with TB and HIV and substance use disorder. So we're talking about very challenging patient population with multiple comorbidities, which complicates treatment for each condition. The other thing that we've seen, and this is a theme throughout the talk, is that there are many opportunities to intervene. People in prison are uniquely, I would say, receptive to voluntary interventions that, from which they stand to, to gain some health benefit. 
And what I mean by that is that for some people, prison is a place where they first access health services and they're exposed to um, health education, uh, health promotion in the form of disease prevention, screening for diseases, treatment for diseases, and linkage to care for, for maintenance after they leave prison. So we really understand now that there are multiple ways we can intervene in prisons to improve people's health. But until now, the focus has mainly been on the men in the prison, which is appropriate, okay? So 95% of the world's prison population is men. So usually when we talk about people in prison, we're talking about men. Now, women in prison have very similar issues and, in, and the prevalence of HIV among women in prison is typically higher, but there are also issues that are different. So we, we could talk about some of those similarities and differences. But one avenue that particularly interests me is how prisons provide opportunities to engage not only men in prison, but their family members and their partners as well. So what's happening now in Indonesia is the HIV epidemic is shifting from a concentrated epidemic towards a more generalized epidemic with heterosexual transmission. So the phrase that I have heard is Ibu Rumatanga which is this notion that women without other risk factors have become infected because they have a partner who injects drugs or has acquired HIV otherwise. So when we went and started working in some of the prisons in Jakarta, one of the questions that the men ask is, when can I have a child, right? When can I, how should I tell my wife that I have HIV? And so for us, that was the aha moment because we realize that public health and individual self-interest meet at the point of what men want to do to keep their families safe and to have family planning and to have reproductive health. So reproductive health planning for people with HIV is, is, is an area where nurses can make a huge difference in terms of HIV prevention uh, healthy babies being born, mothers being tested and receiving appropriate interventions, right? So what we're seeing here is lots and lots of possibilities for how we can improve people's lives and health by using the opportunities that we have when we meet people uh, who are coming through the criminal justice system. The other thing that we have seen with our research, unfortunately, is that although antiretroviral therapy is free in Indonesia, and although it's manufactured domestically or, 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 or imported, that we're, we're seeing these high mortality rates among men in prison and among men who are leaving prison, that's very worrisome in the context of an illness which, for which we have effective medications. So the question that guides much of our research is, if effective medicine is free and effective medicine is available, why do we have such high mortality? What do we need to do to, to reduce mortality in people with HIV who are in the criminal justice system? And so one area where we have focused our efforts is on the post-release period, making sure that people who start antiretroviral therapy in prison are able to continue therapy at the Puskesmas after they leave prison. And this is very challenging for some people because after they leave prison, they are focused on other life issues, including employment and family and housing. And so they don't always get to the Puskesmas. So we need nurses are potentially change agents who can bridge 
the care that men receive in prison to the care that they receive in the Puskas Mas. So how do we do that? One possible solution is through home visits. So the idea with home visits is that you go and you visit the person in their home and you spend time with them talking to them about their understanding of the medication and how they're taking the medication. And so nurses are appropriate for this role because they have knowledge in nursing assessment. They have training in monitoring adherence. We've also investigated whether peer educators can contribute to these discussions in a way that supports adherence. So this is kind of a conceptual model for what the nurses and the peer educators do when they do these home visits. So we have a team in, in UE uh, that is nurses and peer educators, and they've been doing home visits with Warga Binaan that are that are Baru Dibebaskan Dari Panjara uh, in Jakarta. And so they do they go and they visit them at home and they do CD4 monitoring in the home. Uh, they report lab results, they do counseling, uh, they do symptom assessment for other, uh, for other comorbidities, including TB and sexually transmitted infections, and they do counseling with the family and the partner. So the, pro the educational process begins often in the LAPAS where we have, we have a physician, a nurse and a peer educator who meets every month with the patients as a group. And this is where they do the counseling in the prison. And what the, Oh, forgive the, oh, I'm sorry. Let's see here. What's going on? I don't know why I have a yellow line on my screen, but uh, that's, so what we have here are some preliminary results from the Athena trial. So we had 58 men who received home visits after they were released from prison. And we had 44 men who received only a referral letter for care at the Puskas Mas. And as you can see from this chart, the men that got the home visits were much more likely to remain on antiretroviral therapy after one month after release compared to the group that did not get home visits. So the red line is typically what happens after people get out of prison. They, uh, 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 something like a third or half of them discontinue treatment. And that's dangerous because we know that the more often you start and stop treatment, the more often you get potential drug resistance. So there was a study by, um, by some scientists at UNUD um, in, in, in Dunpasar. Uh, some, of, some colleagues did a study and they looked at HIV in people who inject drugs in Jakarta. And the most important factor associated with, with HIV infection, excuse me, with drug resistant HIV infection in that group was a history of incarceration. So that's, that, for me, that was confirmation that, that we, there is an opportunity to decrease drug resistance in the community by intervening during the post-release period for these men. And that's really important. That's really important. It's almost an epidemiological level finding because if, if drug resistance is being introduced at, at, a, at a predictable frequency, through a certain route, it really needs to be identified and acted on. So, so this issue of post-release is not only about improving care for men who leave prison, it's about meeting the national priorities for HIV control. Look at that red line. These are people who were on therapy and then they discontinued treatment. 
Now, some of them got back on treatment like six months later. And I think that's a testament to the quality of the Indonesian healthcare system, number one. The, you know, I think some people, they get out of prison and it takes them a few months to sort things out, but then they're gradually able to resume treatment. So there may be a couple things going on there, but from, but I, I think it shows that intervening after during the month after release does make a difference. Okay. So as I said, you know, prisoners are not a discrete population. They overlap with other populations. So we think a lot about maternal child health. We think about men who have sex with men. We think about people who inject drugs. We think about people who engage in transactional sex. And my point is that what we're finding in our work is that when you start intervening with men in prison, it gives you opportunities to intervene with other people in the society. And that's a real key point, I think. And I can give you some examples. So what we're doing now in Jakarta is we're training nurses to do HIV partner notification. So HIV partner notification was recently endorsed by the World Health Organization. That's when someone with HIV gets counseling to be able to tell their partner about their HIV status or have a health official confidentially and anonymously notify your partner for you. So why is this important? Because if you know you've been exposed to HIV, then maybe you'll take a test. And if you take a test, maybe you'll get diagnosed earlier. Women in Indonesia with HIV get diagnosed later than men. That's a consistent finding across at least two studies that I've seen. And I, I think it's also a trend that's, that's been reported on by the Ministry of Health. So why is that? Well, because a lot of the key populations, men were overrepresented in prisons and also among people who inject drugs. And so it's only recently that we're finding these opportunities to do testing with people who uh, do not have any of those traditional risk factors for HIV. But as you might imagine, going to a stranger's house, especially in Indonesian culture, where I think there are social norms and etiquette around how you talk about sensitive topics, this has been a very challenging process for our team. This is not an easy intervention, but we're showing that it's possible to train bachelor's level nurses to do HIV partner notification in Indonesia. So what our team did is they went to five prisons or jails in Jakarta and they recruited men with HIV. Those men named their sex and drug injecting partners for the year before incarceration. And then our team went and tried to locate um, individuals, partners, who the prisoner gave permission to contact. So this is voluntary. Uh, the men had to give permission for their partners to be notified. And everyone in the study had an option to tell their partner themselves. So we gave these men different choices how they wanted to tell their partners. So that was the basis for the research study. How are we doing on time, Mega? Are we okay? Yeah, yeah, just continue. We can, con uh, we can follow your, your time. Oh, okay, okay. So I am coming to believe that this is something that nurses really, we should be thinking about how to train nurses to do this kind of on a larger scale. So this is like the counseling that you already do when someone is HIV diagnosed. So you're gonna explain what HIV is, you're gonna explain what treatment is and why early treatment is better, but then we can also integrate these five steps into post-test counseling. 
So what are these five steps? Well, number one is we explain why it's important to notify your partners. And it's not just your current partner, it could be your past partner, right? People that were your partner a year ago, right? Number two is we train nurses to gather the necessary information. So you need to have enough information that you can locate the partner and you can positively identify the partner because you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to tell the wrong person. You want to make sure that you have the right person before you share this information. Number three is where you offer choices. So that involves being able to give someone different options for how they want to tell their partner. Now, prisons are very unique because people don't have the freedom to leave prison to go find their partner. And so they're entirely dependent on whatever means of communication they have. Or in the case of our study, we had healthcare providers who conducted the notifications on behalf of the men. Number, step number four is probably the most challenging. That's where you have to locate people. Um, and for many reasons, people are difficult to locate. Uh, and people are also very skeptical when they're approached by a stranger claiming that they are from, you know, a public health agency and that the person has knowledge that the other person has been exposed to HIV. Okay. So people have told me there's a lot of phone scams in Indonesia. Like people will call your phone and they'll pretend to be somebody and they'll try to get you to wire them money or something like that, right? There's a lot of phone scams in the US everywhere, I think. So there's a big trust issue uh, with partner notification. And we are learning how to implement partner services in a context where uh, there's a high level of trust that's required to be successful with the intervention. Okay. And then what we know also is that testing is just the first step. Testing is, is a gateway to other types of prevention and treatment services that we want to be able to offer to people. So that's a really important point too. Testing is just the beginning. So this uh, study design was a little bit unique because the people in the control arm were allowed to choose the intervention later in the study. So this was a way to gain additional information about the intervention. And it also addressed a key ethical issue. So as you all know, there's additional ethical requirements when you work with people in prison. People in prison have additional research protections. And so we were conscious of that and we designed the study so that all men had the opportunity to receive the intervention. So I want you all to think about that when you're planning your own research, are there ways to design your, your experiment so that it is more equitable? And what I would point out is when you make your study more equitable, sometimes you also get additional information. So the additional information that we got was we learned about uptake of the intervention among people who, were, who had tried to tell their partner, but were unsuccessful telling their partner. So we told some of the men, we told half the men, okay, go tell your girlfriend, go tell your wife, I'll give you six weeks. You have six weeks to tell your wife that you have HIV. So then six weeks later, we went back and we said, so did you tell your wife that you had HIV? And more than half said, no, I did not tell my wife that I had HIV. Why? Well, because she changed her phone number or she doesn't want to talk to me anymore or 
it's impossible to contact her when I'm in prison, right? And you, th those who work in prisons, you know about this issue, right? So then they needed our team to contact the wife or the girlfriend or the boyfriend and have them come in and, and get that information. So my point is, is that we were able to offer that service to everybody during the study and it, it gave us additional information about how much they needed that support. Okay. All right, and also we used a rapid HIV test. So the advantage here is, let's say you find somebody, okay, a partner, and you notify the person, you say, ma'am, I have information from somebody who was diagnosed that uh, you, you may have been exposed to HIV. And then after they process that information, one of the next questions is, one of the, one of the most important next steps is, is to find out whether or not you have HIV. And so to do that, we would start with a screening test. And so one of the recommendations is to try and shorten the time between when people are notified of an exposure and when they're tested for HIV. Just like we want to shorten the time between a positive diagnosis and when people initiate therapy. So we thought, well, what if we just carry HIV tests with us when we go into the field to do notification? So the team that does the notification also has laboratory capability to do HIV testing in the home. So that makes it more convenient. There's also confidentiality issues with HIV testing in the home. Um, but this is something that is, I would say, in a research phase. Is it feasible? Is it acceptable to bring point of care testing into the home. So this is simple to use, just like a pregnancy test, and it gives you a result in 15 minutes. So this is something that we train nurses to do all the time. The question is, is it appropriate in this new context? So I just want to thank some wonderful people that I work with in uh, in the Department of Corrections in Ditchenpas, also our colleagues at UE. Uh, at um, I want to thank our colleagues uh, at Yayasan Palita Ilmu, and we just have a wonderful group of collaborators, nurses, doctors, peer educators, nursing students, and they've all made outstanding contributions. This is our team uh, from several years ago at UE, and that's my collaborator in the middle, Dr. Waluyo. And then some of my other colleagues there, uh, Melody, uh, who's uh, sitting to the left of me in the picture, uh, just completed a PhD in the United States and has done a Fulbright. Um, so several of these students in this picture have also appeared on publications and things like that. So we're using the research as a vehicle to develop people's research capacity. So if you have an idea for a project or you have an idea or your group, you know, if there's a group of you and you have an idea for a project that you wanna do, that's when collaboration can be really helpful because you know, now we talk about team science. So it's really about putting together an outstanding team. And the metaphor that I use is imagine you want to travel into space, right? You need a pilot, you need an engineer, you need a nutritionist, uh, you need somebody who's a doctor, right? So you need a team, right? If you're going to be successful going into outer space. So these research projects have a, have, they really benefit from teams that are multi-professional and where people are bringing together different skills and interests. So that's, that's really the reward for this. And then our relationship, we've also have a wonderful partnership between UE Faculty of Nursing and uh, the Department of Corrections, Ditjenpas, 
to do service and also and also to do teaching and research uh, with with uh, care providers who work within the Department of Corrections. So we're trying to look at how can academic partners like UE work with the um, the the. the the ministries and also with the with the non governmental organizations uh, to create synergies uh, around health. And I know that some of you are involved in that work and that a lot of that work precedes precedes my arrival. And um, I know that's a very active area for many people. So uh, what we're you know we we talk about priority setting a lot and so i'm i'm always curious uh to hear how priorities are changing i know covid covid in prisons has received international attention and it has really changed uh how we think about uh prison health and i know indonesia w was also in the headlines because uh it it uh because of the compassionate release program early in the epidemic that resulted in i think several tens of thousands of individuals being released uh, to reduce the overcrowding um, so i think that you know we're all learning from from one another during covid about what works best and there's there's many things uh, that 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 the, that we can learn in the U.S. about about the Indonesian experience, and uh, vice versa. We're also learning how to more effectively engage with community partners. You know, we we always approach this with different agendas, right? Like we have the researcher agenda, and then the community partners have an agenda. Of course, the the government has an agenda, and it's like bringing these into alignment and finding out where are the areas of overlap and how can these be complementary. For me personally, this has been a really rich and rewarding experience to, to uh, live and work in the Indonesian culture and uh, to, to, to do that over a longer period of time than I think many people are lucky to do. The ethical challenge just uh, the ethical challenges continue to 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 uh, occupy my interest, how we, how we conduct research and how we provide clinical services in a way that's respectful of people's human dignity and their innate rights. And one of the things that I tell my students in the US is, um, is um, about all the positive things that are happening, especially around healthcare for people with substance use disorders in the Indonesian uh, sites that I've that I've had the privilege to to be in, uh, methadone I think is a program that is it has received international attention, and it's something that is recommended by international agencies, and it's it's uh, it's addressing addressing an important need for people who are in those settings. And I want to thank my colleague Dr. Waluyo at the University of Indonesia. Dr. Waluyo and I were in the PhD program at UIC together. And what we're learning is that building a research program also involves a lot of management and administrative skills within the university. We're often talking about, we're, off, we're talking about money for research uh, that's specifically allocated for research and how to manage that money in a way that, that allows us to achieve our research aims and grow our program of research. And finally, I'd like to thank my mentors, both in the US and in Indonesia, Dr. Kamar Ulsaman at the University of Malaya, Dr. Altice at Yale, and Ann Williams at Yale, and my mentor and colleague and friend, Dr. Waluyo at UE. And then the final thing is so many wonderful students have worked with me over the years. Um, these are two of them in La Paz Chipinang almost 10 years ago, but it's been really rewarding to watch them grow in their careers and for them to become scientists. 
um, and they went from being research assistants to being to to working independently as as nurse researchers and and continuing to do that work um, in addition to their clinical practice. So, uh, one of the ways that we measure success is in our ability to kind of continue with these projects and overcome setbacks. So thank you all for your time. I think we have, we, we left some time for questions, is that right? Or, or anything that you'd like to talk about? Okay, uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. And I think we have, uh, questions from students, uh, please, Mbak Nana, you can di uh, directly deliver to Dr. Colbert. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. McMake. Hello, sir. <laughs> uh, my name is Nana. Nice to see you, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask your experience, sir. From the slide before, you have many mentors from different uh, universities are so can you give a recommendation for us maybe like uh, when we want to ask another opinion from the another university i mean like uh, this is not uh, meaning that our uh, lecture is not good but uh, maybe somehow we just have to find another point of view like that sir maybe you can give us a, rec a recommendation sir i mean like you have a lot of experience and uh, a lot of uh, great people to see you, like uh, Miss uh, Miss Mega or even Mr. Waluyo, as you said. Maybe that is my question, sir. Thank you. Yes, that's a great question. So you have tools that I did not have like 10 or 20 years ago. So today there's Facebook, today there's Twitter. There's like so many ways to communicate with people around the globe, right? So it's actually much easier to find collaborators now compared to 10 years ago. I mean, you have ResearchGate. Uh, there's like, there's social media just for researchers now. So you may want to think about one of those platforms, but here's the important thing. When you approach another person as a collaborator, have an idea, okay? Have an idea for something that you wanna do and, 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 and ask the person for specific advice about something related to that idea. So the way that, the way, when we're thinking about a grant application, one of the first things we do is we write an AIMS page. So an AIMS page is a one page document where you describe the background of the problem, the current state of care, what scientists know already and what we don't know and how you will fix it or how your research will address the gap in knowledge or will address the gap in clinical care. So that's like a mini proposal. An AIMS page is like a mini proposal. It's a prospectus. It's a one page document that kind of says, hey, I've got this idea and, and here's what it is. And if you go to NIH website, you can look up, um, or if you look at the CLIMB program at Northwestern, C-L-I-M-B, here, I'll put it in the chat box. There's this, this document is called an AIMS page and it's like a cover sheet for a, a grant application. But my point is when you approach somebody else, it's good to have kind of a specific idea because people get approached with general queries all the time. You know, a lot of people get like, you know, a lot of emails every day. And so one thing is, well, uh, what email is junk and what email is something that's maybe interesting? And the interesting one is the one that has a little bit of thought and work attached to it. And that thought and work is, can be in the forms of an AIMS page. I would not send your CV or something like that. I think people are less interested in you. They're more interested in your ideas. Uh, 
Okay, sir. Thank you for your answer, sir. Uh, I'm also curious, sir. You uh, get a professional in community as you explain at the first place. And uh, do you take a specialist? What kind of specialist you take, sir? I mean, before before your PhD. Well, I have an undergraduate degree in nursing, and I worked in a I worked in hospital and community settings for about five years, and then I had my PhD, and at that point, I went full time into research. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Manana, for the questions. And then I have a private message. <laughs> Uh, from Alivina Safira, a CE student uh, in the first level, in the first grade. And she asks about uh, education uh, for prisoners. Is there any uh, barriers to educate them and how uh, to deal with the barriers? Well, I know that there, there are many active programs at different prisons. Uh, I don't know the full scope. I mean, there's many programs. They have peer support now. I mean, some of you in the audience know that it depends which prison, right? There's a lot of variation, right? So maybe some have many programs, maybe some have few programs, but one of the main ones I've seen is peer support programs. So peer support programs can be very effective if they're done correctly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the barriers to education are primarily, you know, offering it in a way that people find, you know, useful and engaging. I mean, one of the things about people in prison is, is they, they're in a captive environment. So there are, there are potentially many opportunities to quote unquote, give education. I think the question is what is the, what is the type of education that they're receiving? What's the quality of that education? And that's the question everywhere. That's the question in prisons anywhere, not only Indonesia, US also. Mm -hmm. And, and often, sorry, often when they cut the budget, when they cut the budget, education is one of the first things they cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe in my experience, there is like a barrier to how to make them uh, interested in our program for the prison. I, I know, but that, that was why we did that research. I think the answer ah. is ah. you have to they will tell you what's important. I mean, I remember one young man in Jakarta, he said, when can I, when can I have a baby with my wife? So actually, there's an answer to that question. You can have a baby with your wife when we get your viral load under control. And also when we get, when we get medications, prophylactic medications. So in other words, he was asking about something that was really interesting for him. So he was ready to listen. You know, I think, I think it's like we have to aim the education at, and the good news is that the things that we want to teach about are the same things that they're interested in. They don't want their wives to get this infection. They don't want their babies to get this infection, you know? So we have information that they want, but it's a question of, being able to engage them in a way that makes that information kind of accessible for them. So we have to know them uh, hope first and then we match with them uh, what they want, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think the peer group stuff works really well because these are like really sensitive topics. You know, this is, these are like some of the most sensitive topics. So would you prefer to discuss it with someone who's like, I don't know, you know, it depends on the person, but some people are uncomfortable if their doctor is a man or if their doctor is a woman or if their doctor is older or if their nurse is older, maybe they rather talk to their friend. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why the peer educator thing works well, I think is because it makes it more comfortable to talk about these sensitive issues. However, nurses can also do this very effectively. 
right? Nurses can also do it effectively. It just depends on the nurse. Some nurses are better at it than others. So it just depends. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, and, uh, Gali from, I think this, uh, this is a correctional nurse from Malang. All right. <laughs> and we have a group in WhatsApp group and uh, most of them is uh, curious about the scope of practice. Ah. Uh, what are the different nursing in prison with the community? Because we are uh, in the community setting, but maybe there are so many like uh, uh, procedure like in the, they have uh, some words, some words in the, in the uh, correction. So they, 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 they uh, like confuse what is the scope of uh, practice of this correctional nurse. Oh, sorry. Um, well, there's, an, there's several excellent textbooks on correctional medicine and correctional nursing that I think are written from maybe more of a, I don't know, I think they're, they're US textbooks. I mean, scope of practice depends on jurisdiction. So if you're in Germany, scope of practice is different than scope of practice somewhere else. But what I will say as a general principle is that nurses in Indonesia and nurses in the United States are vastly underutilized for when you consider their training. So there were several randomized controlled trials in sub-Saharan Africa that showed nurses perform the same as doctors for HIV management, but higher patient satisfaction. This was, this was multiple clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is almost 10 years ago. After that, the World Health Organization recommended task shifting. Task shifting is when you take a job that normally a physician does and you assign it to another health worker, maybe a nurse, maybe a peer educator. But the idea is there's more nurses than doctors so let's shift the work to nurses so that these interventions, I mean, one of my first slides was showing mortality in men with HIV. HIV is a totally treatable disease, 100% treatable, more treatable than cancer. So why are people dying? People are dying because they're not getting the medicine. Why are they not getting the medicine? Because we're not using nurses to their full potential. That's true, not, again, this is not like one country. This is like multiple countries around the world. People are dying because we have a healthcare delivery problem. We have the medicine, the medicine is free. We have a healthcare delivery problem. And I'm saying one of the ways to solve the healthcare delivery problem is to recognize the resources that already exist. And, and the most important one, it, or one of the most important is nurses. Nurses can do this stuff. Nurses can do all of this stuff that doctors do with HIV management. And if there's doctors and they're thinking, well, wait a minute, what about this? What about this? Trust me, everybody in the US said the same thing. And then we started having nurses and nurse practitioners working in teams with pharmacists, with infectious disease doctors, with oncologists. Because when you have HIV, you need the whole team, oncology, right? It's everybody at the table. So, you know, that's what inspires me is this idea that we really could fix some of these issues if we would expand the scope of practice for nurses. And the evidence shows that we should be doing that. The international recommendations say we should be doing that. But I think the barrier probably has to do with, with, with uh, the rate at which that, that change can happen because it, 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 uh, change, those sorts of changes involve uh, relinquishing control over certain aspects of healthcare. I don't know, I don't know the extent to which that's part of the issue, but um, scope of practice has to change if we're going to meet these needs. 
Yeah, uh, I'm interested with the training for nurses in correctional uh, institution that you have done before. Is there any like issue for the for them uh, in the for nurses in that training? I I mean that is there any like some competencies that they should have in this uh, program? I'm sure there are. I'm sure that I, I could probably look them up. I'm sure somebody has published like competencies for correctional nursing. But again, I'm not, I'm not sure they would be very different than community standards. In fact, probably whatever, you, whatever standards and competencies you use for community health, use them in prison. It's probably the same competencies except higher acuity, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the noise. <laughs> no, now we, it's have, okay. we have a question from uh, Mbak Tiara. Uh, please, you can deliver your question directly. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for allowing me to ask. It's such an honor to ask to ask to you, sir. Uh, hello, my name is Tiara Amalia. I'm first semester student. Uh, so uh, what I know in Indonesian prison, gender will be grouped together according to their sex. So men will be grouped with men, so do the women. I think it's a big opportunity to them to experience sexual perversion, perversion like gay and lesbian. Uh, what I want to ask to you is, uh, is it one of the factor of why AIDS IV develop in prison? Thank you. Well, the, the HIV is more transmitted, uh, the, the, the substance use is the real issue or historically that's been the issue. Um, I think, you know, popular culture like movies and television makes it seem like prisons are like full of sex and like there's, I think popular culture representations are maybe not 100% accurate about reality for a lot of men in prison. That said, there's a whole like, there's a whole literature on like men's relationships in prison. And I don't, I don't really wanna get into it too much. I'll just say that substance use seems to be the bigger factor. Why, why? Well, needle sharing, uh, one act of needle sharing is much, much more likely to transmit HIV than one unprotected act of sexual intercourse. So, I mean, there's some prisons where the guys talk about uh, renting needles, Munyewakan or, you know, Jarum uh, Suntik rental, you know, and it's like that's, that's, that's almost guaranteed to, to lead to outbreaks of HIV in a way that unprotected sex, you know, probably wouldn't. But the issue, the issue is really, it's, let's say everybody was having sex, okay? What's the public health issue? The public health issue is we want to prevent transmission of HIV. It was funny, I was in a prison once and they said, oh, we used to have condoms in the prison. And I said, oh, that's good. And they said, yeah, but then they all got stuck in the toilets. And so there was like bochor everywhere and so we stopped giving them condoms and i was like astaga you know because it's like if the condoms in the toilet that's good it means they're actually using it for the purpose you know maybe you should get a bigger trash can or something but they said the solution was they just stopped giving out condoms so you know yes there's risk behaviors you know like this, this is a world where people do risk behaviors. So then, you know, then you're faced with a dilemma, right? Do you condemn the behavior and hope that it'll go away? Or do you educate and encourage and steer people towards behaviors that are going to be safer for them in the long run? Um, while letting them know that, you know, you're you know, I think a non-judgmental attitude goes a long way when you're talking to people because people are going to close up if they feel like you're judging them, 
you know, and I know that part of our training as healthcare providers is to have a non judgmental attitude, even in situations where someone's behavior seems like inconsistent with our moral values. Like, you know, at least, you know, healthcare education, a lot of it is about bracketing, you know, your moral assumptions while you're engaging with the patient. And so for me in prisons, that often means like, I never ask people sort of like, why did you get arrested? You know, because I'm sort of, I don't care why they got arrested. You know, I don't care if it, you know, I don't care. It doesn't matter. The, what matters is now you're here, <laughs> right? <laughs> so how you got here, okay, whatever. It's like, now you're here. So let's deal with what the problem is right now, you know? And so I think that's why we've put our emphasis on condoms, methadone, clean syringes. Um, because, I mean, the main reason is the evidence suggests that these are effective for slowing HIV. Okay, uh, we still have two students. Is it okay? Please. Okay. Please, um, Riska. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you've explained before that some of the ex-prisoners or prisoners are afraid of spammer, um, telling them that they have HIV. And you've explained that we need to uh, give trust with them. Can you uh, elaborate more on how to gain trust with them? Well, I mean, you know maybe better than me, right? Like gaining someone's trust is very like, I don't know, how do you gain someone's trust? I mean, I have ideas, but I'm curious because I think it's different in every culture. The way, okay, I have some patients who come in and they're obviously mistrustful. So they don't make eye contact. They don't really talk. They, they don't really open up. And so one of the approaches that I use is I let them know that they are the driver. They are the driver of the car, okay? I'm a passenger in the car. They're the driver in the car. You are the boss. The patient is the boss. I work for you. You know, I try to flip the script a little bit with mistrustful patients. So if a patient comes in, they're usually mistrustful. Why? Because you have all the power. They have no power. And you're going to make a bunch of decisions for them without listening to them. That's what they fear, right? So you do the opposite. You come in and you say, hey, how are you doing? You let them know that they're in charge. You know, they're making all the decisions. And when you say that to somebody in prison, it's really powerful because they have no power in prison, right? So you say, you're the boss. You can do treatment. You cannot do treatment. But I want to make sure that you have the information that you need to make a decision, you know, and we'll revisit this question periodically. So that's one way to gain trust. The other way to gain trust is you have to be consistent. That means, you know, like in settings where there's high staff turnover, you never really get to know anyone. Like, and if you never get to know anyone, how can you trust them? Plus, some people just are naturally gifted. They just, they are good at getting people to open up. I know a few nurses, like, they can get anyone to open up. You know, they're just really good at talking and they really make people feel comfortable, you know? Okay, thank you for the examples to explain how to get trust for a yeah. prisoner. And then we get Mbak Lotusha, please. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Bumaga, uh, for your opportunity. And also, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. That was a very Great presentation. So uh, we probably already talked about the barriers of the, in the prison to give the uh, council to give the consultation. So what I want to ask now is maybe 
you have any barriers or obstacles on training the nurses to become the counselor. So, I mean, what kind of challenge that you have to train the nurses to become the counselor or maybe so they can have a great competence to get to become the counselor or to other uh, counseling process? Yeah, thanks. This, yeah, this sort of relates to the former question. So we've spent we've spent a lot of time figuring out what are the most important messages for pe for patients to hear. Okay, so I think about this idea of cognitive burden. Okay, sometimes have you ever had a doctor or a nurse and they tell you all this information and your head is just not able to absorb all the information? I think some of the young men or some of the, the patients are, they, it's, a, it's too much information to take in the first time. And so I think what we wanna figure out is what are the most important messages that people should hear about antiretroviral therapy? In other words, we're, it's like social marketing, you know? When, you're, when you watch an ad on TV, it's only like five seconds long, right? It's really short, but it has a powerful message, right? Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Reebok, Nike, right? So you're always trying to think about what's the, what's the message that's going to connect with the patient, the, in, right? I mean, you do that with your patients, right? You try to find out how can I, how can I say this in a way that will be impactful for you? Right. So with the nurses, it's, it, they already have the counseling skills. The issue is there's a little bit more knowledge that some of them need, particularly around antiretroviral therapy as an effective form of prevention. So the, for about five years, maybe longer, we've known that antiretroviral therapy when given to someone with HIV effectively acts like a chemical condom. It prevents that person from transmitting HIV to somebody else. So if we can get people on treatment and suppress the viral loads, then this is gonna reduce transmission in the prison and in the community. And so that's, that's one of the reasons that that's an important goal. Okay, I think it's, uh, it's all. No, I have no, no question at now. And now it's 9.18. I think it's not too late <laughs> there. <laughs> okay, I think uh, now uh, we are in the end of the sessions. I would like to appreciate uh, to Dr. Kulbert for the great talk and for the participants for the hot discussions today. I believe that all participants uh, here can get more uh, knowledge of and experience from Dr. Kulbert and, and for the uh, nurses correctional, we have uh, some nurses from Banda Aceh, from Sukabumi, and from uh, Ambarawa. <laughs> we uh, uh, maybe we uh, uh, in the future we can get uh, collaborations with Dr. Corbett to improve uh, the nursing care in the correctionals. Okay, I uh, I hope I'm so. If if you can organize such a meeting, I would I would love to attend. Sure, sure. I will. Uh, will uh, we will have a, a moment with all nurses. We uh, in, invite them. Maybe they have like a barrier in communication, but we can we can solve this barrier. Okay. Thank you so much. And I apolog apologize if I have uh, some mistakes in this uh, session. Thank you so much to Dr. Kerbert and all participants. And uh, you, good everyone. morning and good evening, Dr. Kerbert. Good night. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Terima so kasih. Sampai okay, jumpa bye. lagi. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.